Welcome everyone um, to this evening's exciting 5x15 event coming to you live and online via Zoom. Since we started our online series in response to the global pandemic, it has been such an honor and a delight really to be able to welcome people from all over the world to be part of 5x15. And tonight is no exception. We've got um, amazing speakers zooming in from the West Coast of America, from Holland, from the furthest reaches of the UK. And we are starting the week in style with a lot to look forward to on a Monday. Um, and I wanted to say a huge thank you for your continued support for our online series. It's brilliant to have over 500 people signed up. Um, and, um, and I wanted to give a shout out to the exciting um, event that we have coming up um, later this week. We have Lee Child, one of the world's biggest selling authors, um, who will be zooming in ahead of the publication of his new book, The Sentinel. Um, but tonight um, we have an incredible lineup. Um, we have the amazing historian, um, and really hero of Davos, uh, Rutger Bregman. We have the hilarious Ruby Wax. We have um, the musical history coming to us from the legendary New Yorker journalist, Alex Ross. And we have a personal story of magpies and fatherhood from the fabulous Charlie Gilmore. But without much further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker tonight, joining us ahead of the launch of his very powerful new poetry collection, The Actual. We're delighted to welcome back to 5 by 15 um, Inua Elams. He's a poet, performer, and a um, playwright, and his many plays include the National Theatre's um, Barbershop Chronicles, which was a huge success and sellout, and The Three Sisters, which was Inua's adaptation and rich retelling of Chekhov's play. And he has a current show also sold out, I'm, I'm afraid if you want to get tickets, but um, it's at the bridge and it's called An Evening with an Immigrant. It's based on a play that was first staged in Edinburgh in 2017. And he's here to tell us about it and to read a few poems from the actual. And we are very, very honored to have Inra with us. Over to you. Um, hey, thanks, Daisy, and um, hello, those who have joined us tonight. Um, my name is, well, Daisy has said a lot of that anyway. Um, and I'm going to read from this new book of poems called The Actual is Black and Gold is Glimmering Like That. And, um, and it's a poem of, um, it's a book, sorry, it's a book of, um, what, what is it about? Um, it's a litany of grievances, I think. And it started off when um, the American president said something which angered me a little bit. And I wrote a poem called um, Fuck, Fuck Trump. And then I thought it was a little bit, you know, nail in the head. So I called it Fuck 45. And then a friend um, encouraged me to write 45 similar poems. And I wrote 55 of them. And the longest poem is seven parts long in a book. So it's a sequence of poems that are intensely personal, intensely political. Um, it reads as polemic. And, um, and they cover various things um, that affect um, myself and the politics, political spaces that I find myself in here in the UK. Um, but it starts from the very um, creation of Nigeria. Um, and I'm gonna read a few poems that follow that lineage um, from the conception of the country um, of which I was born, of which, of, of, which um, um, of my heritage, and then brings us right up to the moment. Um, now, the Portuguese were the first Europeans to reach Nigeria in the 16th century, and they came largely to trade, but also they established the transatlantic slave trade in southwest regions of, my, of, of the country, an area largely populated by the Igbos, one of the major tribes. So please remember the Igbos, because they're going to come back later. The north, where my ancestors were formed, were closer to the Arab world, which was ruled mostly by these nomadic tribes that fought and settled and intermarried each other, the Hausas and the Fulanese. And my paternal ancestors come from these places, come from these people, sorry. When the slave trade was finally abolished, the European um, powers still needed to make money from these regions. Um, after the Berlin Conference in 1884, the British government took over the Royal Niger Company, which was what had been established in that place to trade. And, um, and, under, and through the guise of this country, they colonized both sides of the country, killing and pillaging until the people were subdued and formed into a single country, a single factory, a country-sized factory, Nigeria, which was established in 1914, which coincidentally is when this building that I'm in right now um, was completed in 1914. Now the Nigerians rebelled and eventually gained independence in 1960, but um, there was havoc after that. 
Democracy, which has arguably failed here in the UK, was imposed in Nigeria after centuries of having something more um, 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 more organic in place. And it was imposed along tribal and geopolitical lines, which meant that the northerners, the Hausas, would always be in charge of the entire country. This was largely to serve capitalist interests. The Royal Niger Company still operates in Nigeria um, and is now called Unilever. And the Brits would then pull the strings from Downing Street and, the rule, and, the, and, and through this, they were able to rule the Hausas. Now, the other Nigerians were really displeased with this and they rebelled. And this eventually led to the Civil War um, and the Igbos um, were the bots, um, were the, were suffered the most under this. This led to, this led to the, the Igbos wishing to separate from Nigeria. They declared the Republic of Biafra and this left millions internally displaced in the country. And a lot of this I dramatized in the play Daisy mentioned, um, Three Sisters, um, but this poem covers the journey of millions of Igbos from the northern from northern Nigeria fleeing the houses on foot and getting towards the southern region. And this is the first poem from the actual, and this poem is called Fuck Nigeria. You are Nigerian until they massacre your elders, until the breeze blows thick with blood. You are defiant until they erase your home, burn your harvests, shred your clothes until the locals forget you built the road you walked in on. You disbelieve until they separate your husband from his head, your wife from her eyes, your brother from his belly, until your sister's drool thickens the dust and no limb stares when your child is called. You are an infidel until your parents ask you to leave, to pack a handkerchief with food and run. You are a refugee until the river spits you out, until the miles of woods and wilds of pasture stop clawing at your raw skin. You are brave until bullets and mosquitoes bite the night the same way, until bombs fall frequent as fruit, until any whistling empties your bladder. You are a wreck until the guns dance to silence, until you, your people fold, officially surrender, you are relieved until night sweats, trembling. The swollen bellies of skeletal children begin haunting your every dream. For the scorched skin stretched the cross skulls and their looming eyes in your quiet hours. You are Biafran until you die, until the struggle breaks your back. Um, and the fallout of, um, of the Civil War was the genesis of Boko Haram. Now, the Civil War, as I said, was along um, tribal and political lines, but also religious lines. The Igbos from the southern regions were largely Christians, Catholics, and the Muslims and the House of Sir and the Fulanis were, were largely Muslims. And um, because of how power was mediated through the country, those in the southern regions who had given themselves or who were better colonized um, were educated by the British, which meant that um, they had, um, they, they felt, um, what's the word here? They felt um, they were naturally rebellious to House Saru, who they felt weren't educated as well, um, as well as they were. And the divisions ran, ran really deep into the country. And into this, I was born in 1984. My father was a Muslim from the North and my mother was a Christian from the Middle and Southern region. And um, my father, my parents respected each other's faiths, um, but my father traveled to Mecca for the pilgrimage. And when he was there, he saw some things he wasn't too pleased with and returned to Nigeria, questioning his faith. And that created chaos, which meant that um, our lives were unsafe. We fled from the north to the southern regions, but some of the violence followed us until we left Nigeria in 1996 and came here. Now in that period, um, some of the Muslims in the north were displeased, like I said, with the governance structure of the entire country. They felt like the British were totally in control. There was too much um, corruption running through the entire country. And they were largely hippies. Um, a huge contingent of them were camped around a watering hole in the north, which the Nigerian government wanted to get their hands on. And these Muslim hippies sort of did humanitarian work. They'd look after um, 
um, refugees streaming from the northern of the country, from Chad, from Chad and Niger, who streamed into Nigeria, fleeing persecution. And they sort of did all of this work, but the Nigerian government really wanted the area in which they were camped around. Um, and the, the government eventually drove them out, um, out of the country, um, attacked a huge number of their, of their, of their ruling elite. And um, when they left, um, they, got, they, they traveled up further up the continent towards Niger. They got weapons, they aligned themselves with, um, with ISIS and came back to Nigeria angry. And um, that's when the militant force Boko Haram came into existence. And what they did was they looked for men like them, young men like them, who were either uneducated, who were disenfranchised, who felt ignored by the government and who had no um, opportunities to work in the country. And they promised them food, shelter and purpose in life. And this poem um, called Book, um, Fuck Boko Haram really looks at the cycle of violence and what attracted these young men into these ranks and how it still plays out across the Nigerian um, country right now. Um, Boko Haram were famously known for kidnapping 264 girls from Chibok and a lot of them are still missing to this day. Um, so this is the poem. After the guns had danced to silence, the boys whose father was killed the boy whose father was killed joined the others sipping cough syrup in the tight corners of the parched village, their eyes hollow and hungry for things their widowed mothers could not provide. There were never enough schools to teach the possible rift between thought and action. The boys would lash out wild as scuffling dogs in the scavenging heat, which the men who killed their fathers took for killer instinct and came back masked in the Koran's floral lilt, promising their empty bellies fulfillment, their empty hands purpose, their empty lives love. The boys followed their lolling tongues into the desert, days and nights tottering past rattlesnakes and scorpions as the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had done, seeking his destiny in caves, where more stories of him were flattened like curved knives and slipped like drips of concrete into the breaking parts of the broken boys. And bit by bone by brick, they were built into the militia of black flags and fire who return to the village now, guns dancing, who speak into the silence over the fresh corpses to the newly hungry and hollowed eyed boys, promising fulfillment, purpose, love, their mouths like gardens blooming in the desert's bleak. And um, the last poem I'll read, um, really looks at the space there is for redemption in Northern Nigeria for these boys, these hardened um, um, young men who were radicalized. Um, and a lot of that work is happening through literature in, in the Northern region, house of literature specifically, so not written in English or in Arabic, but in a dialect and language that is local and specific to the country. And, um, and a lot of this work is produced by women in the North who are reclaiming um, not just the matriarchal lineages which they stem from, which was colonized by Islam um, and by um, West, Western um, culture, but also um, their own stories, creating space in this discourse, not just to offer redemption to these young men, but to themselves, for young women who, um, who they are raising their own daughters. Um, some of them is, um, some of, these, these are three of, of, I think, the most groundbreaking um, Hausa writers, novelists from the north, um, Rahma Abdul Majid, um, Balarba Ramat, and Amina Abdul Malik. And these women writers who were raised in a patriarchal society that encouraged self censorship and declared that their writings should preach goodness to avoid badness, an idea from the Quran where the Muslim is urged, urged to observe and promote what is proper and to prevent what is improper. And they found themselves navigating Islam and house or custom, trying to find the nugget of truth of space. And this poem is written in that light to bring imagination and a space for rebirth back to the land, back to the north um, where these boys are. Um, it's called Fuck Deserts and is written in response to a poem by a friend of mine called Kayo Chingonyi, who's an incredible poet. And, um, and this is my last poem for the evening, Fuck Deserts. Take the path that begins among the neem trees, as far as the stream bled of all water. Sift through its dried bed of discarded boots, you will find a rust-covered compass, buff against your sleeve, 
when it winks with sunlight, go whichever way its needle points north. Turn right when the farmland thins to a grassy sheen. You will come to a village with none of its youth. Place your palm on the closest hot, hot husk until you sense the wind quickening tremble the walls. Punch through, push down into the hole and grab the topmost sash of vulture feathers. Hold one between your teeth until your tongue numbs, bite down. When you regain consciousness, the huts will be the sand dunes around you. Desert will hold you in its golden nothing. Lift the camel skull by your inner left thigh. Look through where once lived its left eye. You will find, stretched from horizon to the petrified sky, the answer to whom you were meant to be, how you have bested that self, and why this is still just you beginning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Inua, you are so brilliant. And it's such an honor to have you with us when I know you're incredibly busy, not only with your stage play, but also launching your new book and collection and congratulations on it. And I hope that everyone will get a copy of the actual, which is out today um, from Pen in the Margins. And it's really great to see you again and um, see you soon. Thank, Thank you very, very much for being with us. What a start to our week. Thank you very much, Daisy. Thank you. Thank you. And now um, we're very excited also to have joining us from Holland, the economist and historian Rutger Bregman. He's a journalist for De Correspondent, which is a Dutch newspaper, and he shot to fame in Davos in 2019 with his speech about taxation and the super rich, which went absolutely viral within a few hours. And um, we have really wanted for him to come and speak at 5 by 15 and we feel very lucky that he was able to do so this evening to talk about his latest book, which is called Humankind, A Hopeful History. And I think it's something that we all need right now. Um, the Guardian described it as the sapiens of 2020, and it does offer a new and revolutionary view of human nature and human history. And it argues that people are essentially good. Um, his previous bestseller was called Utopia for Realists, which has been a very influential book. And we are thrilled to have him with us from just outside Amsterdam. Um, thank you, Rutger, and over to you. Welcome. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Um, it is really great to uh, be part of this uh, wonderful group of uh, brilliant people and thinkers. Um, so I wanted to tell something about um, my new book, Humankind, which was published a couple of months ago in the UK. It's been a really strange experience publishing a book like this during lockdown. Um, it is basically a book about what I consider to be a very dangerous idea, a very subversive idea, um, which if you really think it through has quite radical implications for how we organize everything you know, for our personal lives, but also for how we, you know, do business, how we organize our government, how we do democracy, you name it. And if I would summarize the idea in one sentence, it would be something like, deep down, most people are pretty decent. So that's it. That's sort of the whole book, uh, 500 pages in one sentence. Now, the problem is obviously is that no one believes that, or at least there are very good reasons not to believe any of that, right? I uh, remember telling a friend uh, that I was writing this book and he said, yeah, but what about sort of all of human history? How do you deal with that in the book? So I realized that, you know, there's just so much that you have to talk, talk and write and think about um, in this case. There's a really old idea in Western culture which says that our civilization is only a thin veneer, only a thin layer. And that below that, human nature, you know, real human nature is something very dark, but deep down we're all selfish or beasts or, or even monsters. Um, there's a, a primatologist, a Dutch primatologist, Frans de Waal, who calls this veneer theory. And, and veneer theory goes back, you know, a long way in, in Western, Western culture. So you already find that with uh, the Asian Greeks, for example, uh, the Greek historian Thucydides, or, uh, well, Orthodox Christianity, St. Augustine talking about the notion that uh, we're all sinners, you know, that we're all born as sinners. 
uh, or read the Enlightenment philosophers. Um, read people like Thomas Hobbes or Adam Smith or David Hume or the founding fathers of the United States. John Adams once wrote an essay with the title, All Men Would Be Tyrants If They Could. Uh, or we can, you know, uh, think about evolutionary theory, or we can think about, you know, modern capitalism, which, you know, for the past couple of decades, I think basically the central dogma was that people are just selfish and we just need to deal with that. So this is a very powerful idea that comes back again and again uh, in our culture. And in this book, I argue that it's basically wrong um, because there's really been this sort of silent revolution in science in the past 15 to 20 years is that scientists from really diverse disciplines think about anthropologists or archaeologists or sociologists or, psych or psychologists. They've all been moving from this quite cynical view of human nature to a more hopeful view, to a more hopeful view of who we are as a species. Now, I don't have much time tonight. So I was thinking what, I, what story I really wanted to tell. And um, I think that just has to be the story of kids on an island. Because this is one of the, the interesting things that I've always experienced as an author is that you can go on for a very long time about all kinds of scientific studies and meta-analyses, et cetera, which is important to talk about. But you know, we tend to remember the stories. Now, when I started writing this book, I knew that there was one story, one very powerful story that I would simply have to deal with. Um, this is William Golding's novel that was published in 1954, Lord of the Flies, and that, well, probably all of us have read. Um, it's not as famous in the Netherlands, uh, where I'm from, uh, but it's still pretty famous. And obviously, especially in the UK and the US, millions and millions of kids were basically, well, forced to read it in school. Um, I remember reading it when I was 16 years old. Um, and I remember feeling quite cynical and depressed afterwards. You know, I remember thinking, hmm, well, no more Harry Potter for me. This is probably what kids really uh, are like. This is how they behave. Um, it was only while I was writing this book that I thought, hey, but has everyone, anyone ever sort of researched whether it ever really happened? You know, has there ever been a real live Lord of the Fly story? You know, a real case where kids shipwrecked on an island and, you know, basically had to work together and design their own society. So, um, well, I'm obviously a proper investigative journalist. So I started on Google. I started, uh, you know, with uh, search words such as uh, real uh, live Lord of the Flies, kids on an island. And after a while, I, I ended up on a very obscure blog. It didn't look very reliable. But anyway, they had, they had the story of supposedly that kids had shipwrecked uh, near Tonga, which is an island group in the Pacific Ocean, and that they had survived on this island for 15 months by staying friends. And then I thought, hey, but this is, this is something that I need to devote more time to. So after a couple of... Uh, uh, hours, you know, I was I was searching and searching, but I couldn't, I, I really couldn't find a source to back this up because the original article said that it happened in 1977. But after after a long time, I was really lucky. This sometimes happens during researching and writing, is that I I was accidentally looking in a newspaper archive from the 60s, and then I found that it was a typo, 1977, and I found that it did actually happen in 1966. So there was this headline from the Australian newspaper, The Age that six kids had shipwrecked on an island and uh, had survived there for quite a long time. And in that article, uh, the names of the boys were included and also the name of the captain who, well, I can't really say rescued them, but let's say found them. And this captain was Peter Warner. At that point, I thought, maybe they're still alive. This happened in 1966. Um, so 50 years later, I mean, they're probably old. So the boys, boys um, must now be 70 years old uh, and the captain 90 years old. And uh, well, to make a very long story short, after a couple of months and after emailing and spamming and calling a lot, a lot, a lot of people, I um, managed to track down two of them. So I spoke to the captain, uh, Peter Warner, and I also spoke to Mano, which is one of the original Lord of the Flies kids, you know, who really survived there, Mano Tota. And just the extraordinary thing to find out was that if this would be 
a Hollywood movie, then people would say, well, this is, this is so unrealistic. This is worse than love, actually. This is, people, kids absolutely would not behave like this. But then, you know, it really happened. So the real life Lord of the Flies is in almost every single way, the opposite of the fictional Lord of the Flies. These kids survived by working together. So uh, Peter and Mano together, they told me the story of what really happened. An interesting fact, by the way, is that they are still the best of friends today. They really consider themselves soulmates and they still regularly go out sailing uh, together. And um, they, they told me what happened 50 years ago. Uh, what happened was that these kids were part of a boarding school in Nukualofa, the capital of Tonga, and they didn't like school. They thought it was very boring uh, and they didn't like the school meals. So they said, you know what, we're going to go on an adventure. That's what they did. Um, they borrowed a boat. Then uh, when it was getting dark, they, uh, they left the, the harbor. But then already that night, they made a big mistake. So they fell asleep and ended up in a storm. Um, their boat was pretty much destroyed and they drifted for eight days without food, without water. They hadn't prepared that well. They didn't even have a compass, so they had no idea where they were going. Uh, and then on the eighth day, they were, you know, in a very bad shape, but shipwrecked on this island and then started building their small civilization. And it's just, it's just extraordinary that in almost, as I said, in almost every single way, it's, it's the opposite of the fictional Lord of the Flies. If you've read the novel, then you remember that the fire, you know, was, a, was an issue, you know, they didn't really control the fire. And uh, at some point, half of the island burns down. But in this case, the real case, they got a fire started and, you know, let it, they kept it going for, um, for more than a year, you know, never let it go out. They worked in teams of two, two to tend to the garden, two to uh, cook, and two to be in the lookout for ships. They had their own badminton court, uh, you know, to play badminton. They had their own gym to, with, with sort of curious weights that they designed by, uh, by themselves. They made a guitar. Uh, they wrote songs. Um, you know, when Peter Warner, the captain, sort of, as I said, found them, they were in really good shape. They were very healthy, and they uh, could have survived there for years and years if they wanted to. And uh, then they developed this friendship with, with Peter, the captain, that lasted for more than 50 years. So, yeah, as I said, it's a very, very wonderful story that's all about friendship and, and, and courage and what I, I would call survival of the friendliest, which is now a really important hypothesis in biology and evolutionary biology, where biologists have come to believe that actually what distinguishes us as a species it's not just that we are, can be really cruel. And I mean, that's undeniable. We are one of the cruelest species in the animal kingdom, but we're also one of the friendliest because we can cooperate on a scale that no other species can. Now, as we all know, we humans tend to become the stories that we tell ourselves. Stories are never just stories. You know, we, we sort of behave according to our stories in our culture. And I think that especially right now, you know, in 2020, in the midst of this pandemic, this very dark period, you know, if you just look at what's going on in the US, I mean, it's genuinely terrifying. Um, but this is also a moment where maybe we need new stories, different stories of how people can always also work together and survive. And so um, that's one of the stories that I uh, like the most from the book and that I really love researching. It was one of the highlights of my life. Uh, they're now going to make a film out of it. And uh, the four survivors, this, there were six boys in the island, four of them are still alive. Uh, they've also reconnected and recently I had the huge privilege to be part of a Zoom call, you know, again, the, the, the lockdown had, had already started and um, yeah, it was uh, the four of us and, 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 and it, or the four of them and me and Peter, the captain, and uh, yeah, it was the first time they, they saw each other in a very long time and um, that was really, uh, that was really one of the highlights of, of my career so far. So, um, well, that's it. I guess my time is up. Thanks for your attention and uh, thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Rutger. Um, that was such an incredible story. And as you say, so welcome right now to hear um, something optimistic and hopeful. And, um, and as you say, I think we need to hear more stories like that and to think about what that means in terms of human cooperation, especially at a time like this right now. And um, I hope that everyone will pick up a copy of your book. It is out right now from Bloomsbury. It's called Humankind, A Hopeful History. Thank you very, very much for being with us. 
Um, so next up, we have a very uh, special uh, guest. His, his book is out now. It's called Wagnerism, Art and Politics in the Shadow of Music. Um, Alex Ross has been the New Yorker's music critic since 1996, and he's now turned his attention to Wagner with this epic and hugely important book. Um, he's had incredible endorsements from uh, the likes of Stephen Fry and Patti Smith, and, um, and he's been the New Yorker's um, music critic since 1996, and he wrote The Rest is Noise, which was a history um, of 20th century classical music, and it was a a huge phenomenon and it's sort of sparked a massive conversation and indeed an entire festival at the South Bank Centre. Um, it is a thrill to have Alex with us this evening. He's zooming in from California and um, I hope you're there and um, welcome. Thanks so much. It's wonderful to be here. Welcome, Alex. Uh, I'm here, yes. <laughs> um, uh, it's wonderful to be here, and um, I absolutely agree with Rutger in, the, in these uh, troubled times. Uh, we need uplifting and inspiring and heartwarming stories. Uh, unfortunately, I did spend uh, the last decade writing a book about the most notorious and controversial and perhaps irredeemably malignant composer in musical history, uh, Richard Wagner. Um, and this is the book, uh, Wagnerism. Um, it's, uh, it's not actually about uh, the man uh, himself. It's about his influence and his shadow. The subtitle is Art and Politics in the Shadow of Music. Uh, from the uh, mid 19th century onward, a remarkable array of writers and painters and poets, architects, dancers, uh, uh, filmmakers, uh, philosophers, uh, were affected in one way or another by Wagner. And, and some embraced him, uh, some rejected him, some wavered back and forth between extremes, but in one way or another, uh, their orbit was uh, affected by the gravitational field uh, of this uh, huge planet Wagner. Um, and the cast of characters in the book uh, goes from Nietzsche to Baudelaire and Mallarmé to uh, George Eliot, Thomas Mann, Willa Cather, W.E.B. Du Bois, Theodor Herzl, Virginia Woolf, T.S. Eliot, Joyce, Proust, Kandinsky, Eisenstein, it goes on and on. Uh, obviously, in, in the brief time uh, available uh, tonight, I'm not going to be able to uh, sum up these stories uh, in any way. So I thought I'd talk about um, my own uh, experiences uh, with Wagner and how I found my way to a kind of uh, cautious love for him. Um, I don't pretend that these experiences are in Anyway, uh, anywhere near as interesting as this, this, the, the great gallery of uh, figures that I mentioned. Um, but perhaps they do show uh, how Wagner still remains with us, um, despite uh, periodic attempts to get rid of him, uh, and how he is still uh, evolving uh, in the lives and, and minds of contemporary spectators. Um, I think I'm ab about to make a little bit of a fool of myself, but uh, making a fool of oneself over Wagner is, is really uh, the, the subject of the book. Um, but uh, I grew up with uh, classical music uh, in a very strict and, and traditional sense. Uh, I, it, was, it was all about Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, Brahms, Mendelssohn. Maybe as I got a little older, uh, and became a rowdy teenager. I was listening to Mahler and Sibelius, um, but, but this was uh, basically the music that, that I cared about, um, which as you can imagine, made me uh, tremendously popular um, at school. And I remember distinctly when I first tried to listen to Wagner, um, uh, the music that I was accustomed to had very kind of clear formal organization uh, and sort of demarcations. The first theme, the second theme, development, uh, recapitulation, and, and so on. Um, whereas Wagner, and, and I brought home uh, long playing records of Lohengrin uh, from the uh, 
public library, uh, the early romantic opera Lohengrin, uh, most famous for the uh, wedding march, which has been heard at countless millions of weddings. Um, despite the fact that the, the wedding in Lohengrin is actually a, a complete catastrophe, um, but, but uh, uh, no matter about that. Um, when I listened to Wagner, I, uh, I, didn't, I couldn't detect sort of themes as such that the prelude to Lohengrin, it, I sort of heard this slowly spreading musical goo, uh, kind of one thing bleeding in, into another. And, um, and I didn't like it at all. I, I, I felt rather sick to my stomach and, and returned the records to the library the next day. Um, uh, some years later, I was at university and I was heavily immersed in European history and literature of the late 19th, early 20th centuries. Uh, the, the, the glorious shadowy epic of the fin de siècle of decadence and symbolism and early modernism. And Wagner was always lurking uh, in this period uh, and, and looming uh, as this kind of vampiric presence, uh, a Nosferatu casting his shadow on the wall, uh, a, a menacing presence. And I was very much aware of his anti-Semitism, um, his influence on German hyper-nationalist ideology, uh, the way in which he pointed forward to Nazism, uh, Adolf Hitler's uh, great fondness um, for the composer. Uh, and so Wagner presented himself to me as this gigantic intellectual problem and, and not necessarily as someone to be loved and embraced. But nonetheless, I was listening to more of the music. Um, and I remember I was uh, uh, particularly attracted and sort of as a late adolescent to uh, the, uh, the gloomiest, most doom laden passages in Wagner, the prelude to act three of, of Tristan and Isolde or uh, Hagen's watch from Goethe Demerum. Um, then in my twenties, um, I, began to experience Wagner in the theater, which is really the only way you can fully experience him because these spectacular excerpts that we hear in Hollywood movies, the Ride of the Valkyries and so on, uh, can give a somewhat misleading idea of what he's all about. And I realized how Wagner was in fact uh, a, a remarkably acute psychological uh, uh, composer and dramatist. Um, and, um, you know, uh, the ring cycle is is like uh, a sort of great 19th century bourgeois novel in, in a lot of ways. Uh, on the surface, it's the sort of cartoonish affair of uh, heroes and gods and dwarves and magic swords and dragons. Uh, but underneath, it's sort of a series of these finely etched psychological portraits. And Wotan is like the patriarch of a great family in decline. And he's grasping after new technologies and trying to forge new alliances to perpetuate his power. But in fact, he, he ensures his own destruction. Um, and for me, it wasn't just a, a intellectual understanding, uh, but also I developed this, this uh, personal connection and this uh, sense of how, how my own life and my own feelings were mirrored back to me um, in, the, in the music. And, and, sometimes somewhat embarrassing ways. Um, at a certain point, I, I sort of fell into the habit of inviting uh, some object of my affections, uh, in this case, another young man, uh, to a Wagner performance um, in the hope that somehow a combination of the, uh, the magic spell of the music um, and my own uh, careful explication of the plot would, would lead to some kind of a romantic uh, breakthrough or epiphany, which um, really didn't happen. Um, and there's one particularly uh, uh, ludicrous and painful moment where uh, there's one uh, a brief relationship that I sort of prematurely tried to uh, uh, consecrate by uh, inviting my boyfriend uh, to attend uh, the entire ring cycle of the San Francisco opera. Uh, with me uh, somehow as a, a affirmation of our youthful love. Um, and in fact, the relationship wasn't really working out, uh, mostly unbeknownst to me, um, uh, thanks in part to my emotional immaturity and, and uh, was no need to relitigate all of this after 20 years. Uh, but after the second night of the cycle, uh, Devalcura, 
immediately after Brunhilde has been consigned to the Ring of Fire and Wotan uh, has uh, kissed her godhead away. Uh, I was informed um, in the rental car that uh, the relationship needed to come to an end. Um, unfortunately, I was uh, very determined not to appear to be uh, unduly affected by this reversal. Um, and so I, I insisted that, uh, that my boyfriend, uh, now ex-boyfriend, uh, and I should continue to uh, attend the cycle together. Um, these progressively longer voyages uh, into the heart of Wagnerian darkness, uh, Siegfried, which goes on for five, five and a half hours, uh, Goethe Demerung, which can last a full uh, six hours, um, sitting next to this handsome guy who's no longer interested in me, feeling this uh, maelstrom of rage and humiliation and confusion and, and despair, uh, and of course, uh, grandiose uh, self-pity. And this was exactly the moment at which I finally understood Wagner, uh, because this, this welter of emotion uh, and these collisions of contradictory uh, emotions are what his operas are all about. Um, I won't carry on in this embarrassing vein, and I should make clear that this the, 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 there's only one or two pages at the very end of the book, which are which are like this, and everything else is kind of just you know good tedious cultural history. Um, but the the point is, I think um, that Wagner. Uh, and, and I think this applies to so many of these outsized uh, artistic figures uh, from, from history, work upon us in this very complicated and fundamentally double-sided way. Uh, and on the one hand, uh, there's the historical fact of the work um, and, and all the enormous historical baggage uh, which comes with a figure like Wagner and, and the overwhelming force of the personality of the creator himself in, in this case. Uh, but then we as spectators have power to reshape the work and, and stamp it with our own extremely personal meanings. And the annals of Wagnerism are full of such radical and wildly idiosyncratic reinventions of the work. Uh, and of course, uh, it is also mediated by the singers who bring their own personalities to the music and the conductors who reshape the interpretations and the directors uh, who can have very startling new conceptions of what the work uh, is all about. And so it's always changing. Uh, it's never fixed. And uh, these double experiences sort of unfold side by side. And it's not a matter of choosing uh, between them. Uh, we are aware of the history, but we also value our private understandings. Uh, music reflects its maker and it reflects ourselves. Um, at a and at a time when we are struggling to come to terms with the, uh, the, the damaged and damaging uh, uh, specter of uh, uh, artists of the past, the case of Wagner shows us that there's always another chapter to be written and he remains with us, uh, like it or not, uh, unbearable and, and unavoidable, uh, a magnifying mirror of the grandeur and the misery uh, of our species. Uh, as Willa Cather so beautifully wrote, ever darkening, ever brightening. Thank you very much. Alex, thank you so much um, for a beautiful um, talk and thank you so, so much for being with us today. I know it's your morning, so I hope that you have a lovely rest of the day in California and um, that everyone will go and get a copy of this incredible book, Wagnerism, and, um, and just thank you very much for being with us. Um, next up, we have um, Charlie Gilmore. Uh, he's a very, very close friend of 5 by 15 He did a talk for us six years ago, which was absolutely amazing at a John Ronson show, which was on the theme of shame. And his new book is called Featherhood. Um, it's an incredibly incisive and ingenious um, debut. It's a memoir which tells the story of what happened when a young magpie fell into Charlie's world in a Bermondsey junkyard. And he didn't know when he first met that bird how important a bond 
um, that relationship would become. And Featherhood also uh, talks about his biological father, um, the poet, anarchist, and magician Heathcote Williams, a man who also kept a bird. Um, and over to you, Charlie, to tell us a little bit more about the story. Hello, is this, am I on now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hi, thank you everyone. So it's absolutely lovely to be back and thank you Daisy and, um, and Rosie for having me back. So yeah, I, I want to tell you a story about, um, it's about two men who could, who could talk to birds but couldn't really talk to each other. The, uh, one of those men is, is me and as Daisy said, the other is my biological father who is this um, eccentric poet and magician who, who vanished in the dead of night when I was a baby. Now, I imagine most people watching are probably quite familiar with, uh, with magpies. They're one of Britain's most common birds. They're about this big with um, black and white feathers and they're quite bold, cheeky really. Uh, people often complain about them stealing eggs from the nests of songbirds. But magpies are technically songbirds themselves, although their song sort of sounds like someone's blasting you with a machine gun from the treetops. Uh, but uh, anyway, so magpies are fairly common birds, um, but there was absolutely nothing common about this uh, particular magpie. Could we have the first picture, please? Right, so this magpie was called uh, Benzene, and she was a truly magical bird. Um, she learned how to talk, she played pranks, she used to make things disappear, money, jewellery, my house keys. She rode around on my shoulder like a cartoon devil. She was a kleptomaniac and a vandal, and, uh, and I loved her. Uh, Benzine first came to me as a, as a sickly chick, which my partner brought home in a cardboard box a few years ago. She had been found lying in a gutter near a junkyard in, uh, in southeast London. She was a black and white ball of fluff about the size of a child's fist. At first, I didn't really have that much hope for this baby bird. I'd tried playing nurse to wildlife before as a kid, and it seemed like no matter what you do, they always end up in the same place, which is uh, a shoebox at the bottom of a shallow grave. Also, all I really knew about magpies was that you're supposed to salute them whenever you see them to ward off the bad luck they allegedly bring. But uh, saluting this baby bird wasn't exactly going to keep it alive. So I made some phone calls and uh, the first person I called was my grandmother, who's somewhat eccentric. Uh, uh, over the course of her colourful life, she's had all sorts of pets, um, geese, stray dogs, wounded sparrows, monkeys. Uh, she also, when I called her, uh, I, I discovered for the first time, has a lifelong hatred of, of magpies and her advice was that I uh, drown the bird. So I dug around a little bit more and there isn't really that much information out there about how you keep a magpie alive. Um, they're members of the crow family and they're more often shot as, as pests than kept as pets. So it was quite a shock when I discovered that my absent biological father had once had a fierce bond with another member of the crow family, a jackdaw. And uh, if we can have the second picture, we can see him with, with his bird. So here he is um, in the round room at, uh, at Port Elliot. And uh, this sort of uh, coincidence of crows, this, sorry, this, uh, this coincidence of crows seemed wildly improbable. It made my head spin a little when I tried to calculate the odds, but it also made a, a strange sort of sense. I never really knew my biological father. Like I said, he vanished when I was a baby, leaving about as much trace behind him as a bird from an open window. But from a distance, he always seemed like a man possessed of powerful magic. Hethcote Williams was a conjurer, a poet, and an anarchist. What I knew of him came secondhand from stories told to me by my, by my mum, sort of, it was built of hand-me-down anecdotes, and uh, uh, he sounded absolutely fascinating. There was one story about how he used his conjuring abilities to steal Christmas from Harrods, a turkey and all. Um, another about how he had once taken control of several streets in West London, opened the houses to the homeless, and then tried to declare independence from the United Kingdom. And he was apparently passionate about animals. 
so much so that he once shat into his own hand uh, through his excrements at a Dutch performance artist who was about to have sex with a live goose and then ran away with the goose. So him having a tame jackdaw that used to ride on his shoulder like a pirate with a parrot fit the picture. Why not? Now, I wish that this could be a story about how an estranged father and son finally bonded over a shared bond with birds. It's a story I'd love to be able to tell, but uh, our relationship wasn't really like that. I had his telephone number, but I was about as likely to give him a ring as I was to follow my grandmother's advice about what should be done with magpies. I'd tried in the past with Hethcote, uh, tracked him down a few times, but it had always gone catastrophically wrong. Mm. We'd meet, he'd be charming, fascinating, funny, refuse to explain why he'd left, and then he would cut me out of his life all over again. Again, without a word of explanation, and eventually I sort of cracked. Um, so I suppose I, I might have been harboring a dim hope that this bird might be a key that would finally unlock the past, but it was futile, really. We were both um, emotional cripples, in relation to each other, at least. But this bird, these birds, it was a connection of a kind. My magpie, his jackdaw, both members of the crow family, Carrie and Kin. Although I only knew about his bird because my mum remembered he'd written a poem about it, a, a poem that, uh, that seemed to make him and his bird come to life. Hethcote's jackdaw, which was christened Jack, surname of Daw, fell from its nest in the steeple of a village church into Hethcote's care a few years before I was born. Back then, Hethcote was living at, uh, at Port Elliot, which is a stately home in Cornwall that belonged to Lord Peregrine Elliot, an old school friend of Hethcote's. Uh, from what I've heard, Hethcote had basically, he had sort of control of an entire wing of, uh, of Lord Elliot's home. And when the jackdaw came along, it sounds like the jackdaw also had control of an entire wing and indeed control of, of Hethcote. Um, Jack roosted in Hethcote's nest-like tangle of dark curly hair, dug lost sixpences from Lord Elliot's lawn, shat all over Lord Elliot's carpets and tore Hethcote's books to shreds. It turns out there's a reason people don't tend to keep members of the Crow family as pets. They're noisy, they're demanding, their eating habits are foul, and they're far too clever. It's like looking after a baby, but one that needs to be fed raw meat and worms every 20 minutes. This was something that I discovered firsthand as I tried my best to care for the baby magpie that my partner had brought home. This curious avian echo across decades brought me no closer to my biological father, but it did bring me a great deal closer to birds, too close for comfort at times. I'm ashamed to say that up until that moment, I'd never really thought that much about birds. They just seemed like feathery automatons, bird brains. For example, I'd never have thought that a bird could have a personality, but uh, Benzine the magpie had personality in buckets. She used to wake me up just after dawn uh, by jumping on my pillow and screaming in my ear for breakfast. And if that, that didn't work, she would pinch my nose right here. Um, Magpies, it turns out, love to play, hide and seek, chase, keep away. She even charmed my grandmother, that, uh, that hater of magpies, if we can have the next picture. There is my grandmother who, uh, uh, up until this point, you know, she used to take pot shots at magpies, um, but they became very firm friends and uh, they actually bonded over a sort of shared passion for murdering flies. Um, so when the time came for Benzine to fly away, if we can have the next picture, um, she soared up into the air and she flew into a loop and uh, she landed right back on my arm. Um, there we go. So I, we tried to let her go and she just flew up and around and straight back. Um, what I didn't know was that by hand feeding that little magpie and allowing her to live in my bedroom, she had become imprinted, socialized as a human. She was basically anchored to me. Um, I'd raised a bird that wouldn't fly away. 
and you can read into that what you will. About a year into my life with benzene, my biological father performed his final vanishing act. When he died, he left me with a lot of unanswered questions. Why did he vanish when I was a baby? What was so frightening about fatherhood? And a more recent but connected question, how was it that he was able to be father to a jackdaw? At, uh, at Hethcote's funeral, next to the coffin, there was a picture of him and his jackdaw. And looking at that picture made me think of the spectacle of Corvid funerals. I imagine lots of people watching have probably heard about crow funerals, which is when, um, when they come across a, a, a dead member of their own species, they all gather round and they scream for others to join them. They're these sort of incredibly raucous gatherings and biologists haven't quite figured out exactly what their purpose is, but, um, but some believe that they're having a sort of conversation with the dead, interrogating them, trying to work out what went wrong in the hope of avoiding the same fate. And I realized this was something I needed to do with Hethcote. I had to work out what went wrong in the hope that I might avoid the same fate. And so began the messy task of finally trying to get to know my birth father after his death. I looked to the Crow family for inspiration often. They pick and poke and peck apart the dead, taking what they need. And I went places and did things that no son should have to do, things perhaps that no son should do. I pored over letters, diaries, first person accounts of suicide attempts, bitter ravings from a stay in a mental asylum. It was an emotionally gory job, but I finally got what I needed, a story that made some sort of sense. We were two men who couldn't talk to each other, who perhaps instead of talking to each other, talked to birds. It's the story of too many men, perhaps not the birds so much, but that inability to communicate, the desire to fly away from difficult emotions. Birds can bring healing, it's true, but words, I think words are the thing. If I could end with an exhortation, it would be this. Put your difficult feelings into words. Do it now, because there might not be a later. Thank you. Charlie, thank you so much. That was such a beautiful and incredible talk. And I can't recommend Featherhood enough. It was completely unputdownable. I read it in one sitting and it is an incredibly moving story as well as being very, very funny and uplifting in part. So thank you very, very much for writing such an incredible book and for coming to 5 by 15 to tell us that story, that extraordinary story. And um, thank you for having me. we'll see you soon. Um, thank you. Um, so after that amazing, amazing story, we are going to be um, joining Ruby Wax and she is up in an incredible community, an eco village, right up in the north of Scotland. It's called Findhorn. And Ruby is one of our all time favorite speakers at 5 by 15. She is a mental health campaigner. She's a very, very well known comedian. And she's an author and has written a new book, which is called, And Now for the Good News. Um, and I think following on a little bit from what Rutger said, it, um, it shares some of the good news, some of the green shoots of hope and, um, and things that we perhaps need to think about right now, distilling what she's learned from, from experts all over the world, from CEOs, from tech gurus, and, um, and helping us to kind of think anew about how we organize life and how we can put into practice in our own lives, things such as mindfulness, the importance of community and, um, and a huge number of fascinating stories and anecdotes. And Ruby, it is a huge honor for us to have you with us. Thank you for taking time out of your retreat to zoom in and, um, and over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, let me just say, we have to remember that even before the pandemic, we were besieged, bombarded by bad news continuously. I don't have to remind you, it was like we were on a drip feed of one disaster and then another one came 
that it's almost like it became an addiction because well you know part of us is a savage i'm sorry you know and i wrote a book about that thinking my last book that we were pretty much reptilian but i agree with rutka now i made a mistake i think that we're born with I could never say the C word, but with compassion. And uh, the proof of that is a mother um, can only grow a baby's brain through that kind of bond, that love, that oxytocin. So the rage comes later. Anyway, back to my book, which is more important. Um, Ruby? Yeah? Can you adjust the screen a tiny bit down? Yes. Oh, thank you. Did you just see the top of my head? Yes, just for that few minutes, sorry. <laughs> Thanks for telling me. It's important to see me. Anyway, so um, what I always knew is that wherever I put my, and I, actually it's true, wherever you put your attention, where you focus your attention defines who you are in that, in that moment. And you start to get habits of just seeing the world through that lens. And I thought, come on, Ruby, let's pull away, pull away from the bad news and just start to focus on the good news out there. And I don't mean, you know, something frilly, somebody suddenly decided to save a parrot. I mean, let's find those innovators who are reinventing, um, you know, tech, the new paradigm for tech, business, education, community, food, health. And um, so believe me, there are green shoots spouting up there. And um, it made me, I've done it for the last three years, I was searching for them. Actually, I finished the book the night um, the lock-in started. So that's why it's called, and now for the good news. I didn't know. Anyway, uh, there are green shoots spouting that make me, in, that have made me incredibly happy and it does give me hope. And I hope it does the same for you. So we don't all have to start packing our bags and go to Mars. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Musk, but we're not. But the theme that runs through all of my chapters, each one of them, is that the only way, and the only way we're gonna make it is by working as a team. I mean, we have to go back to the old days, not that long ago where we were in community. I mean, that's when humans were at our best. Well, that's when we were at our best. I mean, we knew what to do back hundreds of thousands of years ago. We'd all hunker down around the fire, you know, after a hard day hunting and take care of each other. I mean, obviously not the guy who was eaten, but we'd take care of each other and make each other feel safe. I mean, but now families have dispersed. Mm -hmm. um, most town halls are empty and we are now hunkered, even though we think we're so connected, all in our little corners once in a while, sending out a tweet like a flare from the sinking Titanic. But we've lost the plot, humans. We've lost the point of us. And it turns out the point of us is to mingle. I mean, part of the problem is we live at a time now where success is worshiped above all else, to be a winner at all costs. But I just want to say something quickly here that I thought this was interesting, that Darwin didn't mean survival of the fittest was survival of the most uh, aggressive and savage and driven. He meant those who cooperate the best survive the longest. By the way, the person who coined survival of the fittest was a guy called uh, Herbert Spencer in the 19th century to convince people that human beings were built to compete and fight. It was poverty that stopped progress. And inevitably, if you have a winner, there has to be a loser. And then industrialists jumped on it to justify their greed and went all the way up to Gordon Gecko saying greed is good and nobody argued. Anyway, that's how we've been living. And I think it's paid, well, it's, <laughs> it's reaped havoc to say the least. Um, there is a chapter called community. And I went to visit several, well, many, communities in the cities with their how they're doing city planning now so that uh, they're making the journey uh, more interesting than actually getting to your destination. So there's little nubs, you know, little hubs where people can meet and there's parks that push people together if you want to. But, you know, we're always on the way somewhere. I mean, again, our God is busyness. So that, you know, it is in the architecture. We can push people together. But there are things called intentional eco communities, and um, there's about 10,000 of them. I went to some. Uh, some of them are really snazzy. They're in New York. Um, some, there's some African in Cape Town, there's a few. Some favelas have turned into eco communities. And their mission is the same wherever they are is that they work together and they're dedicated to not harming the environment. And 
when they have meetings, which they have quite a lot because everybody has to be heard, the ethos is equality, transparency, and authenticity. And um, by the way, there is one in South London, an eco community. It's free housing. You know, people always say, oh, you need so much money. It's free housing. The Peabody Trust put up the money. Uh, there's no heating bills, and they really know how to conserve energy. Then they share a vegetable garden, right? And they give the food, either they take it or they give the rest to food banks. And then there's a community center and that's what we're missing where, you know, if you have a baby, you can hand it to other mothers and they can take care of the baby and the elderly have cooking classes and yoga and it just oozed happiness. Um, there, and there's cobblestone streets between the buildings. Again, the architecture is pushing people together. So the kids are safe because they can play between the buildings. I wanted to live there immediately. And then I went into education to find out where the green shoots are there. Of course, I stole a lot from Alex Beard, who's Daisy's husband. Uh, he wrote the um, New Learners and I went to Finland following in his footsteps. And yes, it is, it is the model of great, of great education. The teachers, by the way, are paid more than most jobs. So that's just a clue of how they revere the teachers. But just to bring it back again, I did go uh, to a couple of schools in the UK. Um, they're called Reach to the ones I went to visit and they're state schools. It's for kids uh, 11, sorry, five to 11. And they're all in very violent neighborhoods and they all come from disadvantaged homes and with terrible academic results. But I watched the teachers, they teach those kids empathy and they learn how to focus their attention without distraction because we live in a culture surrounded by weapons of mass distraction. So they really teach the kids, you know, to, to cool down their cortisol because they're, they're constant as we are in a fight and flight state. So they have tools that they give these kids. For example, when they're in a class, they go to a corner if they feel themselves agitated and there's a, a red, red color, yellow, green. And if they're in the red zone, they have breathing balls, you know, little things that help them get back into the green zone. And when they feel themselves calm, this means they are regulating their own emotions. Then they take the exam. And by the way, the results have gone off the chart. And um, they go around in a circle sometimes and say, what do they find uh, special about the person next to them? And some kid said to me, oh, I'm just, he didn't know who I am, just happy that you're here. And they're assigned a buddy. So there is a kind of family that they have. And um, the other thing that I really loved is there is no such thing as a stupid question. So I would have flourished there because those kids um, are gonna think out of the box. They don't, they can eliminate low self-esteem and the stupider the question, the better the grade. Because let's face it anyway, I think it's 80% of eight-year-olds now there will be jobs for 80% that don't even exist now. I hope that made sense. And at the end of the day, 600 of the school came together and they sang to me, um, what song did they sing? Oh, A Million Miles, which I can't stand, but I wept and I don't cry because you know I'm on antidepressants, but I wept. Anyway, these are the kids that I hope make the future better. And then I don't know if I have time, I went to business um, to one chapters on business and just to read you, my dad was a killer, my father, who took no prisoners um, in either his private or business life. He passed his wisdom to me, which was screw them before they screw you, was very lovingly said. And if you ever ripped my father off, he would hunt you down and leave a kind of greeting card that that guy did in The Godfather where he put a horse's head in bed with the guy who owed him money. <laughs> that was my dad's technique. So I didn't really trust um, people in business, um, you know, especially now some of them are trying to do the right thing, you know, they're greenwashing, they put, putting a wind machine in the men's loo to replace the hand dryer and probably giving bonuses to people who don't flush the toilet. So I don't trust business at all. But I have seen it with my own eyes. And that's there's a phoenix rising out of the old economic model called conscious capitalism. And there are businesses now, believe it or not, that are motivated by purpose and not by profit. So for example, and there's lots of them, but I did go to, it's a sportswear company called Patagonia in Ventura, California. Although I fell in love with the man who started it. It's like, you know, kind of a cowboy, but they started it about 40 years ago. And um, there's a book about 
Patagonia and it's called Let My People Go Surfing. It'll tell you about it. Each employee chooses a charity that he wants to get involved in. So in the last 30 years, they've given away 10% of all profits. They've given away, um, I think they all pool together and they give away um, $100 million already uh, to over 2,500 environmental groups. And 95% of what they made is they make now is recycled material. They gave me a sweater and it's made out of plastic bottles. And I'm not kidding, they had sunglasses made out of fishing nets. And, and whenever you buy something at Patagonia, they have an ad in New York papers that say, don't buy anything else from us. They just, uh, they say, if, you, if anything gets damaged, send it to us and we'll repair it. So everybody, of course, trusts them. They told me a woman called and said her fleece that she had was peed on by her cat. Could she have it replaced? And the guy at the call center said, sure. What kind of cat would you like? <laughs> anyway, don't, their business quadruples every, um, I think every decade, but anyway, so it's it's not like it's a small little, you know, out of place company that doesn't make a profit. And what's happening now is certain companies are now getting something called a B certificate. It's called B Corps. And it, they give it to businesses that have the highest standards of verified social and environmental performance, public transparency, and legal accountability to balance profit and purpose. And their whole remit is to bring humanity back to business. And just so you don't think it's Patagonia, but Unilever have, for example, within Unilever, they have Ben and Jerry's who um, they're, give a lot of work to refugees. Um, there's Dove Soap, where they work with girls with body dysmorphia. There's, um, you know, there are people starting to walk the talk. I mean, people will go, oh, well, but, well, but somebody's, <laughs> somebody's trying. And I think companies will have to change because they're going to be apps pretty soon. You'll be able to put them over. I'm, I'm sure they're there already, but you'll be able to get the data of the hidden impacts of what of what you're buying. So you can figure out who's got arthritis, you know, from sewing in the zipper of your jeans or how old the kid actually was who put the rubber on your running shoes. And once we find the wrongdoers, I think this really exists, is we could just tweet the bad guys you know, with a this sucks and this rules hashtag. Anyway, I've heard some of the millennials saying uh, giving is the new taking. And then just to finish it off, uh, in tech, believe it or not, they're creating games now for kids, which teach the kids empathy, but the games are still fun. Um, I know when uh, a rocket crashes on a, on a planet and they don't speak, obviously the alien and the kid don't speak the same language, but through facial gestures, they form a friendship. And if uh, the alien picks up anger, it reacts with anger. So the kid really learns how to, how to bond and how to, well, make a relationship work. Otherwise they're never getting off the planet. And then at the end of the book, I, I pick out some charities that really, I think um, are changing the world. I know there's lots of them out there, but I just picked three and one was, uh, the charity called Choose Love Indigo, and I went with them to uh, work with the refugees in Samos, and it, these girls that run it, they look like I did when I was 18. They're completely full of hope, and I got to Samos, and I, you know, what can I give? This is a pathetic thing, and um, <laughs> so um, I'm facing these women who, what can I say? Um, you know, there was a really pretty one called Princess. She had purple you know, purple uh, dreadlocks, you know, they get a, a cup of water at this much a month or something. And she used it to wash her hair. And she's really pretty. And, um, you know, you ask, how did she get there? And she said, well, when she was in Somalia, her husband made a video of a riot and then put it to music. And the police came and said, could we have that video? And um, he said, no, I don't have it. And they shot her daughter right in front of her. And you continuously hear those stories. I, I'm so embarrassed of what I did. <laughs> you know, they liked that I was just there. And um, I said, would you like to have a Pilates class tomorrow? This is pathetic. And so they came. They came and uh, I, we, I did some sit-ups. And then I said, uh, listen, that's enough. These, these are probably tiring you. <laughs> and then I realized these people had carried their luggage and their families on their heads from the Congo. You know, what was I thinking? And then I got them all manicures and I know it sounds shallow, but um, 
I'm going back. I'm, part of the reason I wrote this book is to get ideas on how I can re reinvent my life because I do a lot of reinvention. And I thought maybe the experience I have and the people I meet would help me change, you know, change my life in some way, you know, give it more meaning, give it more meaning. Because I'm so sick of those dinner parties or places where people are yapping, yapping about how awful the world is. And so I was always thinking, well, get off the pot or shut up. The pot, by the way, is elect in America. It's the loo. Get off or shut up. So I've now personally gotten off the pot. <laughs> I'm, I am in a uh, eco community and I I do the vegetables every morning. I've learned to hoe. This is a woman who never touched dirt. Even my garden at home, I, I, may, I planted plastic flowers. So I'm out there hoeing and I'm picking. I have to pick the green stuff out of the kale. And I've never been this happy. And um, what I love here is that they walk the talk. I mean, there's solar paneling everywhere. There's turf on the roofs of some of the homes to hold in the heat. There's biomass heaters, wood chip fuel, fuel, fuel boilers. Waste is turned into clear water and a rubbish, um, there's a rubbish bin where they boil your rubbish and recycle, recycle it into fertilized soil. So out of your own shit, you can grow gardens. So, I, you know, all those words that we're always trying to be so hip and environmental, but we don't know what the words mean. So I think I understand what sustainability is now if you, anyway, the main thing is, is that um, all of these companies really move me. They're, they're working on kindness. Compassion is what's going to make us survive. We're capable, capable of it. We're born with it. That's how the world gets healed. Compassion is also a virus. And we pass it like a contagion. It's a, it's contagious, and so we can infect each other with this kindness. And that's when humans are at their finest. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ruby. Thank you for that incredible and very uplifting talk, and for sharing just some of the examples from this beautiful book. And I hope that everyone will get a copy of. And now for the good news. And also perhaps join your Frazzled Cafes, which I know you're okay. still running. And thank you very much. We're all so jealous of you up in Findhorn in that eco community. Um, what an amazing experience and great to see you looking so well. Thank you very, very much for being with us. See you thank again you. soon. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you to our whole audience for being part of this evening, for your support for 5 by 15 All of your donations will go towards our running costs and we are really, really grateful for those. Um, join us later in the week for Lee Child if you can. And um, what a way to start the week. A big thanks to Inua Elms, to Rutger Bregman, Alex Ross, Charlie Gilmore and Ruby Wax. And for now, it is good night from us and we will see you again very soon. <laughs>